Hi, I'm Dr. Brent Moody. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to be talking about the use of genetic expression profile testing in the care of our cutaneous melanoma patients. As dermatologists and most surgeons, we're on the front lines of treating these patients. And this is one more tool that we can use to help make clinical decisions that guide our therapy for these patients. I'd like to start off by introducing the products that Castle Biosciences has available in the skin cancer space. We have two tests available for cutaneous melanoma, Decision DX melanoma, which is a prognostic tool that is run on biopsy samples or excision samples that gives us information regarding the likelihood that a patient will have a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy and also predicts their risk of recurrence or distant metastasis. Also in the melanoma space is DIF-DX melanoma, which is a tool that can allow the dermatopathologist to help differentiate problematic pigmented lesions and assign a benign or malignant diagnosis to these particular tumors. For squamous cell carcinoma, it is similar to decision DX melanoma in that it helps predict who will have nodal or distant metastasis from a high-risk squamous cell carcinoma. And then finally, uveal melanoma, more pertinent to our ophthalmology and medical oncology colleagues, is the standard of care in staging uveal melanoma. Today, our conversation is going to focus on cutaneous melanoma. I'd like to start off by talking about decision DX melanoma. And the title says, Informing Clinical Decision-Making for Patients with Invasive Melanoma. And in my practice, that is exactly what this test can do. So we have a lot of information available to support the use of this test. As you can see here, there are multiple public publications and multiple patients have been studied. Chiefly, as I said earlier, this helps us make two important decisions. It helps guide the sentinel lymph node biopsy patient selection. So at the front end of a patient's melanoma journey, we can decide, do they need a sentinel lymph node biopsy, yes or no? then it also helps us determine what intensity of follow-up does that patient need? Will they need referral to medical oncology? Will they need imaging? So these are all questions that we confront in our melanoma practices where this additional piece of data can help us guide patients. Let's look at melanoma and the staging. There are certain problems with our current melanoma staging. The chief problem is that we will have patients who are at a low stage, stage one patient, yet they will go on to die from melanoma. So we have a group of low risk patients, some of whom will have high risk tumor biology that is not predicted by current staging mechanisms. A quick review of AJCC staging. So in AJCC8 melanoma staging, only three pieces of data are used to stage the non-metastatic patient. Those three pieces of data are Breslow thickness, ulceration status, and the patient's nodal status. So it's those three pieces of data that AJCC uses to generate a stage and is based on the stage that groups such as the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or the American Academy of Dermatology base all of their recommendations on. And the unfortunate part is that our current staging will miss some patients who have high-risk tumor biology. I like to say that this test can help us find the bad apples who are otherwise in the good apple bucket. So it can help us identify high-risk, low-stage patients and treat them accordingly. As dermatologists and most surgeons, we have done a great job of diagnosing melanoma early. You can see here on this slide that when we exclude the metastatic or stage four patients, 80% of melanoma patients are diagnosed at stage one. And that's a testament to the great work we're doing. Unfortunately, simply diagnosing a patient at stage one does not guarantee them a good outcome because you can see in the next um, uh, diagram that 26% of patients who die of melanoma will be stage one at the time of diagnosis. So this test can help us figure out who are those high-risk 
stage one patients. It can help us answer two clinical questions that I've already alluded to. One, what's the risk of recurrence? And two, what's the risk of positive sentinel lymph node biopsy? From that, we can put patients into one of two groups, the low risk group or the high risk group. And you can see here, the low risk group, those are people that we can follow in clinic, probably don't need any imaging. The high risk group are those that need to be seen much more frequently in clinic, likely need to be seen by a medical oncologist. We should consider adjuvant therapy. We should consider imaging and even consider enrollment in a clinical trial. One thing the NCCN does do is it recognizes that a patient's individual risk of recurrence should drive management decisions and a patient's individual risk of sentinel lymph node positivity drives the sentinel lymph node biopsy recommendation. So the genetic profiling can help us answer both of those questions. There's a very large body of evidence that supports the use of genetic expression profiling in melanoma. All of these are available. And if you see one that is of particular interest to you, your local castle representative can get any of these for you. I will be showing you some data, mostly Kaplan-Meier curves today. I'm not going to dig into all of the data behind them because quite honestly, we would be here all day if I did. But I can assure you behind every Kaplan-Meier curve or every conclusion that I show you in this presentation, there is a robust data source uh, to support what I'm showing you. So let's think about the risk of recurrence to inform our follow-up decisions and how having this additional data with decision DX melanoma can guide our thinking. For those of you who have ordered the test, you know that you can get one of four possible results when you order decision DX melanoma. You get 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2B. And they rise in risk from lowest 1A to highest 2B. Generally speaking, when you order this test, you're getting one of the two extremes, either a 1A or a 2B. About 15% of the time, it comes back as an intermediate result of 1B or 2A. These next three slides, I think, are really interesting and not only can help us as clinicians as we're thinking about how we approach patients, but I think this is information that can help a patient make decisions about their own care and also have an idea of the significance of their melanoma diagnosis in their overall life. These black dots represent melanoma-specific survival based on stage. Let me quickly review stage. So these are the AJCC stages. Stage one and stage two are people with localized disease only. So that's based solely on their Breslow depth and their ulceration. These are patients who do not have any nodal metastases. Stage three is some nodal metastasis. So again, stage one and stage two, localized disease. Stage three, metastatic disease. And just to recap, AJCC staging is based solely on three risk factors, Breslow, ulceration, and nodal status. If we add in CASEL data, to this. You can see what the melanoma-specific survival does. Let's look at stage one, for example. We go from 98% melanoma-specific survival to let's make it easy and say 90% melanoma-specific survival. Uh, and you may say, well, that doesn't seem too bad. You go from 98 to 90, so a solid A to an A minus. I like to think about it the other way. So the stage one patient who is a CASEL 2B their melanoma-specific survival has um, decreased fivefold. They've gone from a 2% risk of death to a 10% risk of death. And you can see what happens for stage two and stage three as well. Now let's take a look and see what happens if the patient is a stage one. And you can see in each instance, the melanoma-specific survival increases. Now for stage one, it's hard to get much better than 98%, but it goes to 99.6.
but that stage two patient, and these can be thicker melanoma patients. These can be patients with, you know, Breslow's of two and a half or three and a half. Um, they go from a 90% melanoma specific survival to 99% melanoma specific survival. So again, a substantial survival advantage. I think the stage three patients are extremely interesting. We look at the baseline melanoma specific survival of 77%, but if a patient happens to have nodal disease, but is a CASEL class 1A, their melanoma specific survival is essentially 95%. The way I use this in clinic is when I get a result back, I print out two copies of the report, a clean copy to give to the patient for their records and a markup copy. And I will sit down with the patient with a highlighter and I will highlight their stage and their melanoma specific survival. So if it's a stage one patient, I highlight that they are stage one and I highlight that they have essentially a 99% five-year melanoma specific survival. Those are the good conversations to have. Unfortunately, we will get 2B results and you have to have the other conversation where you highlight less favorable numbers. That's how I use the, the, the report in a real way to help patients understand their condition. So I mentioned there's a lot of Kaplan-Meier curves and I'm showing you several right now. We are not going to dig deeply into any of these in interest of time. But if you look at them from a big, big picture, they all look the same. Whether it's archival data or prospective data, you'll see that there is a marked and obvious difference in outcome between CASEL class one patients and CASEL class two patients. We look at this meta-analysis of nearly 1,500 patients uh, from four independent cohorts. So that's a large number of data points um, to, to generate this next uh, information. And we look at recurrence-free survival and distant metastasis-free survival. And again, you see an obvious difference between the, the the solid blue line at the top, which is class 1A, and that solid sort of reddish maroon line at the bottom, which is class 2B. Obvious difference in recurrence free survival and distant met free survival. And you see that class 1B and 2A, as we would expect, are in between, so the inter intermediate values as well. This is what the report's going to look like. Um, when you get it back. So we'll come back with an overall class, and then it shows the AJCC stage information and their predicted five-year melanoma specific survival, their distant metastasis-free survival, and their recurrence-free survival. This is where I will take the highlighter and highlight where the patient falls in this grouping. Here's a little bit bigger picture of that. So I will actually highlight if it's stage one, stage one, and they were a 1A, I will highlight that greater than 99% five-year melanoma specific survival and patients find a great deal of comfort in having that piece of information. So let's shift gears and talk about the likelihood of sentinel lymph node positivity. So we've talked about longitudinally what should we do with the high-risk patients? Those, those patients we identify as 2B, we know they're at high risk for recurrence, we know they're at high risk for distant metastasis. That's a long-term follow-up for those patients. The genetic profile of the tumor can also help us make those early treatment decisions, especially the sentinel lymph node biopsy decision. Really quickly to Think about when do we offer sentinel lymph node biopsy? Currently, that is entirely based on Breslow thickness and ulceration status. So AJCC recognizes those two risk factors as the decision tree for staging. And then NCCN takes the staging and decides who should have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. These are the general recommendations. If a patient has a risk of a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, 
that is below 5%, generally it's recommended that the patient not undergo a sentinel lymph node biopsy. If the patient's risk is calculated to be between 5 and 10%, we consider offering sentinel lymph node biopsy. If it's greater than 10%, we generally offer sentinel lymph node biopsy. And you can see on the far left how that corresponds to the patient's T stage. Some interesting things about sentinel lymph node biopsy. When I'm talking to people giving this presentation live, I'll ask the audience, when's the last time one of your patients had a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy? And usually people can come up with some time frame. And I'll say, what about the last three of your patients that had positive sentinel lymph node biopsy? And that's a harder question for them to answer because positive sentinel lymph node biopsies are rare, which is good for our patients. We want our patients to be sentinel lymph node negative, but of the cohort of properly selected sentinel lymph node biopsy patients, 88% will be negative. So we only get a 12% positivity rate. Like I said, that's good. We want our patients to have sentinel lymph node negativity. But the problem with the negative sentinel lymph node biopsy, it's not a guarantee of good outcome. When we look at the cohort of patients who were appropriately sent for sentinel lymph node biopsy, and again, 88% of them are gonna be negative, but in that cohort of sentinel lymph node biopsy patients, two thirds of the melanoma deaths come in the sentinel lymph node negative group. So we can sometimes get a false sense of security with a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So just as we said earlier, stage one patients can go on to die. Sentinel lymph node negative patients can go on to die. So we uh, need to have additional information on thinking about some of this. And that's where the decision DX melanoma tests can help us figure out who are the best patients to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And they developed a predictive model based on this cohort of just over 3,000 patients. There was a training cohort of approximately 1,400 patients to train their neural network to generate their algorithm, and then approximately 1,700 patients in their validation cohort. Let's see what that looks like. So this is the training cohort, and you can see all of the variables they looked at. They looked at the GEP score, and the GEP score ranges from zero to one. We're used to seeing a class with this test, right? 1A or 2B or whatever, uh, but there's actually a number that's assigned to the GEP, and it goes from zero, which is the best possible genetic profile, to one, which is the worst possible genetic profile of the tumor. So variables they looked at, the GEP score, Breslow thickness, ulceration, mitotic rate, age, patient sex, regression, microstaging, uncertainty, that is, did they have a positive deep margin, histologic subtype, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, lymphovascular invasion, and tumor location. So they looked at all of these variables in their training cohort to try to figure out which variables were most predictive of a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy. And they came up with these five variables, the GEP continuous score, Breslow thickness, ulceration, mitotic rate, and age. Um, so none of these should really surprise us. We already knew that Breslow thickness was important as a prognostic indicator. We knew that ulceration was important as a prognostic indicator. In AJCC7, mitotic rate was considered in staging. In AJCC8, it is not. In my practice, I still pay attention to mitotic rate. So that is still an important variable when I'm thinking about my melanoma patients. And lastly, age was found to be an important variable. They then took this algorithm and validated it with the next approximately 1,700 cases. And this comes up with a person's 
individualized likelihood of a sentinel lymph node positive biopsy. And when you order the test, you're gonna get a result that looks something like this. To get a little bit bigger, you'll have an a individual likelihood of sentinel lymph node positivity, again, based on those variables, GEP score, Breslow thickness, ulceration status, mitotic rate, and age. Again, you also get that overall class as well. So based on this, it's very easy to make the sentinel lymph node biopsy decision. If it's less than five, we can likely safely omit sentinel lymph node biopsy. If it's between five and 10%, consideration needs to be given to sentinel lymph node biopsy. And if it's greater than 10%, there should really be strong encouragement to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Of course, this number is not taken in isolation. It's factored in with other patient considerations such as you know, patient's overall health, what are their goals, what are their wishes. Some examples of how this can work. So we have a patient with a T2B melanoma, a 1.1 millimeter um, ulcerated melanoma with a mitotic rate of one. Guidelines would say that this patient has a likelihood of sentinel lymph node positivity greater than 10% and should be offered sentinel lymph node biopsy. So again, based on our current staging of just histology, this would be the, the likelihood. But you can run the test and the patient comes back as a 1A, again, with a very low likelihood of a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy. And so this may be a patient that you could consider omitting sentinel lymph node biopsy um, based on the fact that their probability of having a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy fell below the 5% threshold at 2.9%. The other thing, when I look at this particular report, I see this person as a class 1A. So I know in addition to having a low likelihood of a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, I know their likelihood of dying from melanoma is less than 1% in the next five years. If you remember those earlier slides I showed, um, having a class 1A has approximately a 99% five-year melanoma-specific survival. So again, we could consider omitting sentinel lymph node biopsy in this patient. On the other hand, it could go the exact same scenario, could go the exact opposite. We know this patient would be a class 2B and has a very high likelihood of sentinel lymph node positivity. So this is a patient who we really should encourage to have a sentinel lymph node. And so again, if this patient were on the fence, uncertain whether they wanted to go through the procedure, having this additional piece of data may help them decide if that's in their best interest or not. Again, we would discuss it and, and really offer sentinel lymph node biopsy in this instance. Another vignette, uh, again, a, a gentleman, 66 years old, 0.7 with no ulceration. This is someone that typically we would not, based on NCCN guidelines, offer sentinel lymph node biopsy at a 0.7. Guidelines would say it's less than 5%. On the other hand, in this case, this patient had an unfavorable genetic profile of their tumor. Not only were they class 2B, but the likelihood of their sentinel lymph node being positive was approximately 15%. So this is someone with this new piece of data that it would make sense to encourage them to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. On the other hand, same situation, could confirm very low risk, really no need to do sentinel lymph node biopsy at all in this situation. So this is a new test for CASEL, not the, not the CASEL test, not decision DX, but reporting the sentinel lymph node positivity in this way. It's only been about the last six weeks or so that they've been reporting this. So when you're ordering this test, you will now get this additional piece of information that hopefully between you and the patient and whoever else is involved in their care can give them some additional information to decide whether sentinel lymph node biopsy makes sense for them or not. So a little bit more information about who is eligible for the test. Um, what I do is listed here. Really any Breslow thickness greater than 0.3 millimeter 
in the absence of some reason not to order the test, I'm going to order the test. So in the vast majority of cases, I'm doing that. This really helps me uh, in all of these patients, regardless of their stage, determine the degree of follow-up that they need. Do I need to be imaging them? Do they need to think about seeing a medical oncologist? These important decisions can be guided by their CASEL class. Additionally, for really all patients as well, it helps predict sentinel lymph node positivity. So it makes that early decision uh, about therapy as well as long-term decisions regarding follow-up care. A lot of data have, ha has been looked at by the company. Um, it is covered by Medicare. Um, a lot of patients have been tested. And what's interesting, uh, when it's been looked at, many times this data does change how a patient is treated. Uh, whether it's the sentinel lymph node decision or again, or how you're going to follow them up clinically. I want to switch gears and briefly talk about DIF-DX melanoma. This is a test that helps determine the malignant potential uh, for melanocytic lesions. Again, these are the problematic ones where, you know, in my practice, uh, I work with excellent dermatopathologists, but occasionally I will get back a typical melanocytic proliferation, and it will say, you know, this could be an early melanoma. Um, and there's a variety of ways the pathologist can help figure that out. And this is another uh, test that they can use. It's also one you can request. If you get back a report that you really find that determining the distinction is, is critically important, you can ask them to run this test or send the pathologist sends the test to Castle. Um, uh, to be run. Lot, we do lots of biopsies for suspicious lesions, as we should. Part of our success in di diagnosing melanoma early and helping save lives is by identifying these lesions early. So as a result, a lot of suspicious pigmented lesions are biopsied. And we find a lot of melanomas and we find a lot of melanoma in situ. Again, we want to find them as early as possible. Unfortunately, a lot of lesions, they're very difficult to tell on routine H&E staining. So these, again, these are the ones where even experienced dermatopathologists may have difficulty or may disagree. And that's where this test can help. So you have a melanocytic lesion of unknown potential. Again, we just can't decide on H&E. It looks at 35 genes and went through a validated neural network algorithm. And it gives one of three sort of responses, either benign, malignant, or intermediate. Intermediate, fortunately, is rare. I mean, in, for the vast majority of cases, the algorithm will give an answer of benign or malignant. So the, this is sort of the intended use statement. It's for primary cutaneous melanocytic lesions where the malignant potential is uncertain. And it's an ancillary test to help uh, with other clinical and histologic information. So it's not taken in a vacuum. It's done with what the pathologist sees, what your clinical suspicion was. You can see the sensitivity and specificity for this um, test. Um, again, nearly 500 uh, cases were looked at the vast majority greater than 18 years old. You can see the sensitivity and specificity as well as the, the positive and negative predicted value um, are quite high. And what's nice about this test, as I said earlier, you usually get a meaningful answer, benign or malignant. So intermediate risk result is less than 4%. Again, so if you get an intermediate risk result, you're kind of left still with an un unknown there. This is sort of how it might look like, sort of a workflow. So if a patient, uh, how you do a biopsy, you send it to your dermatopathologist. If they're comfortable benign and malignant on H&E, that's the end of that. But if it's uncertain, there's other stains that can be done. Immunohistochemistry stains, they can level through the block, they can show it to their colleagues. Sort of a lot of things our dermatopathologists are already doing. If it's still uncertain, 
That is where diff DX melanoma can play a role. So again, we have these two melanoma products available, diff DX melanoma to help determine if we're dealing with melanoma and then decision DX melanoma that helps us with sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, selection as well as helps us figure out what type of follow-up does that patient need. So a little bit about uh, the issue of insurance because this does come up. Uh, patients will ask. And I tell my patients they will never receive a bill from Castle Biosciences for any of the products that we might order from them. I will explain they will get EOBs and you know, sometimes that is confusing to patients. They don't know the difference between an EOB and a bill, but I just tell them they will never be in a situation where they will have to send a payment to Castle Biosciences. Um, so uh, when we submit it, we sign um, you know, a, a form, we indicating why we think it's medically necessary as clinicians, uh, and that's really the end of it for the patient. Your local CASEL representative can help you go through any issues with this aspect of the test. So I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Um, and I think we're going to be opening it for question and answer at this point. Happy to take any questions or comments you might have. Thanks for your attention.